Well, thank you so much for joining us this week for me and Maya. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at American Muslim Today. And if you'd like to read more about this story and access more digital content, feel free to check out our website, AmericanMuslimToday.com. We'll see you next week on The Muslim Viewpoint. Yeah, I think like many Muslim Americans, I've been extremely disappointed with the Biden administration's handling of this um, crisis in, in Gaza. Um, and um, what I would call a genocide um, of lessons. Um, so Muslim Amer like many Muslim Americans, I've been um, a registered Democrat um, for as long as I've been a voter. Um, and um, uh, for me, you know, Biden was not my first choice in the primaries. I supported Bernie Sanders um, and canvassed for him. Uh, but once Biden won the primaries, I felt very clear that, you know, I wanted to support the Democratic candidate, that it was uh, important to choose, you know, the lesser of two evils, right? So uh, even though I didn't stand, I didn't, you know, agree with everything that Biden stood for, I agreed with some things, um, disagreed with others, felt that he wasn't left wing enough. Um, uh, I still, you know, uh, wanted to see him in the White House instead of Trump. And I think what I, we've seen in the last 103 days is that um, the difference, especially when it comes to uh, Arab and Muslim lives, is actually negligible. Um, so I can't imagine anything worse than what's happened in the last 103 days. Um, and um, more importantly, Biden and his party have made it very clear that they don't care about my vote. They don't care about Muslim votes. They don't care about Arab votes. Um, they don't care about the fact that we have mobilized uh, for them for two decades. Um, they think that they have us regardless of what they do. Um, and if you're committing genocide, which to me is the most heinous crime humans can commit, um, is not enough for them to lose our votes, then the message is there's nothing they could do to lose our votes. Right. And, um, you know, we still have about a year, a uh, year ish, nine months at this point, I guess, um, until the election day. So what do you kind of hope to see comes out of the Democratic Party or either party? Because right now it's looking like Biden might be the front runner for the Democratic Party. I would really hope that the party chooses a different candidate to run. I mean, I think Biden has shown that he's not able to command um, favorability among voters. He's not able to, you know, he's going against uh, the overwhelming majority of Democratic voters who want a ceasefire. Um, he doesn't represent us. He doesn't represent the party. Um, I think the party would needs to go in a different direction if it has any hope in November. Yeah. Um, and then so currently, you know, there are things that the Biden administration could be doing. Uh, many people have asked Biden for a ceasefire. So what do you think um, they should be doing? Yeah, they should be trying to end this conflict um, as soon as possible instead of helping Israel expand it or giving Israel a sort of blank check of both um, economic and moral support, uh, which is what they've been doing. There should be an immediate ceasefire. There should be a um, recall of all sort of financial support to Israel. They've made it, this Israeli regime has made it very clear that they have no respect for human rights, um, that they have uh, no intention to uphold any standard of international law um, or basic civility. And so uh, the US should withdraw every single penny of support that it, that it currently gives um, Israel. Um, and the Biden administration has the power to do that. Um, and the Biden administration should be trying to encourage peace in the region instead of starting its own strikes. Um, it should not be striking Yemen. It should be trying to avoid an escalation of this war rather than an expansion of it. And then what do you think um, voters should be advocating for here? You know, because as Americans, we have a hand in it because our tax dollars are going towards um, those weapons. Uh, yeah. What, what, what can voters do? 
I think voters need to put enormous pressure on um, the Democratic Party and all elected officials in general. I think it should be made very clear that this is a make it or break it issue, that this is something that people are willing to withdraw their votes over and withdraw their support over, that this is an unforgivable um, you know, thing to support. And um, so I think there should be enormous pressure. I think that, that there has been enormous pressure on the local side, on the national um, side, on the state level. I think we also have to be asking ourselves in community organizing, what does it mean that we're putting on such enormous pressure and yet it doesn't seem to be having the effect that we want? What does it mean that the majority of the American public wants one thing, but the majority of our elected officials want a different thing. Um, I think this really, this issue is highlighting the limits of our democracy, is highlighting the ways in which we live in a system that we don't have as much control over um, as we should, that doesn't actually always represent our interests and our desires as uh, taxpayers and as citizens. So we should also be asking ourselves that question. And then if the Biden administration can't pull it together um, and they are still the front runner by November, um, who will you be voting for and why? Um, I will be voting on the presidential ticket. I'll be voting third party um, and um, uh, on the local level it, and the state level, it will depend on the individual candidates and their stances. I'm not going to vote for any pro-genocide um candidates. I'm not going to vote for a candidate that doesn't have the courage, the, mor the moral courage to um, stand up against this genocide that we're all literally paying for. Um, and so it'll be research on that side. Um, I'm afraid that I think a lot of people, um, you know, we know from research that a lot of people don't show up to the national election if they don't, if they're not in interested in either of the two major party candidates. So my fear is that a lot of people simply won't show up to vote. Um, uh, I plan on still showing up to vote, but I will not be voting. I will not be voting for Joe Biden, um, and um, I will not be voting for any candidate that has that you know has staked their political career on this genocide. Yeah, and then um, so you personally, you have done a lot of research in your career um, on what you call subcultures and how they affect a larger society. So can you kind of maybe speak about, um, I know you've written a book, so maybe that that topic um, and how it relates to this situation, because it is kind of a subculture of religion there um, affecting the political issue. Well, my work is primarily on Muslim Americans. My research is on Muslim Americans, um, including both sort of um, uh, well, including their political leanings and their sort of identities. And I know that, um, you know, for, for Muslim Americans, I think um, what we're seeing is a huge kind of shift in a crossroads where people are realizing that having a seat at the table at the Democratic Party has not been enough, or at least has not been structured in such a way that our votes are being taken um, seriously. And so I think that what we're seeing is a huge kind of shift in the community's effort. And one way is where more active than we've ever been. I think everyone has been pooling all of their resources. Every Muslim organization I know has um, been working in some way or another to try to st stop this genocide, to try to get a ceasefire um, together. Uh, but I think we're also really facing the limits of what, um, what we can do electorally, as well as the limits of our sort of you know, comfortable place within the progressive coalition or what, what once felt like a, a comfortable place. Um, and I think we're not the only ones, you know, so I think um, it's, it's, it's hard to know exactly what's going to happen. I think a lot of people are going to be very disillusioned and deactivated by this, at least on the electoral level. Um, but um, I think people are also galvanized in their um, Muslim identity. So we know that when there is, when whatever identity group you're in faces some kind of threat or some kind of attack, usually people become kind of um, come closer together and also kind of double down on that identity. Um, especially, you know, so with Muslims, we've seen that. We've seen that uh, in 9 11, we saw that around the Trump campaign. We've seen that at various moments that there have been like spikes in Islamophobia. Um, people kind of um, 
relate to their Muslim identity more strongly following those events. And I think for a lot of people, this is a this is a huge um, this is a sort of defining moment, um, and we don't know yet what where the chips are going to fall um, because it's still ongoing. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Aman. Um, I don't have any further questions unless you would just like to add anything about the situation or your position as um, a constituent. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the thing that I just really want to emphasize is that the votes, you know, every community um, is most communities are try, uh, are. Um, wooed for their votes, right? And I think that the Democratic Party has assumed that people of color, certain communities have nowhere else to run and therefore they will always have them and they can take those votes for granted. And we're going to see how that works out for them in November. Um, I suspect they should not be as confident as they currently are. Well, thank you so much for joining us this week. From me and Maya, be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at America Muslim Today. And if you'd like to read more about this story and access more digital content, feel free to check out our website, americanmuslimtoday.com. We'll see you next week on The Muslim Viewpoint.